Hello, my name is Wendy Burton. I'm a GP for Morningside in Brisbane, and my specific interest is in the maternity and early childhood journeys. To help myself, my patients and my colleagues, I've created a non-commercial website and a lot of resources that I have put together, practical things that you would use in everyday general practice, I have positioned there. I reference them in the talk that follows and you're welcome to use them if you would like, no big deal if you don't. So today we're going to do just a short walk through some of the practical aspects of a preconception consultation. And to do so, I'm going to screen share. Alrighty, so preconception care, how does it work for you where you are? Well, in my world, preconception consultations usually happen one of three ways. It can most certainly be that, oh my gosh, as they're heading out the door, the waiting room is full, it's a busy, busy day. Uh, hand literally on the handle, oh, by the way, we were thinking of having a baby sometime this year. Is there anything we should know? <sighs> yeah, there totally is. Oh, okay, option one. <laughs> option two is opportunistic. I am that GP who, as I am signing or emailing the prescription for the contraception, I will say to a woman or couple, I will say, are you planning a pregnancy anytime soon? Of course, usually they look at me like I've gone bonkers because I'm literally just organizing their prescription for contraception, but it's a door opener and sometimes it's really useful. Sometimes they say, oh, well, yeah, actually, we've got the wedding in a couple of months. And then I was just thinking to stop the pill. Is there anything we should know? Yeah, there is. Okay. Or if I'm really lucky, if I'm really lucky, <clears throat> I've actually got a whole consultation just for the purpose of a preconception conversation. And some of these consultations flow from my opportunistic work. Because if I'm told, no, not planning children anytime soon, then that's fine, you know, and I'll say to people, no problems, but listen, if and when you ever start to think about that journey, please, before you do anything, let me know, give me a heads up. I'd like preferably three months ahead of time so we can do some planning and get you as healthy as possible for the pregnancy. And so sometimes that's how it happens. <sighs> but I know that's not usually the way that it goes. And managing our time in general practice, it's really important and it gets so busy and sometimes my head spins and how am I going to do this? What do I do? Well, actually, it's really just like any other consultation. You start with a history, you do an examination and you order appropriate investigations. For me, it helps to have tools and use shortcuts, but what works for you? where you are. So I have built, uh, as I said before, a non-commercial website called Maternity Matters. And this screen is my preconception screen. Um, and you can use the QR code or there's the address if you would wish, wish to have a look at that. And I've got hyperlinks. A lot of what the website is about is collating good authoritative information. Most of it's government funded or non-for-profits. It's almost all Australian content. Occasionally I'll have something from uh, overseas if it was exceptional. Uh, and I really encourage uh, parents to be and uh, new parents and uh, during the antenatal journey, I really encourage them. I know they're going to surf the net and I encourage them to do their searching from within here because www.imtryingtosellysomething.com is just not the best place, place to get good unbiased information. So I use resources here that I've created to help with those conversations. I'll whip out a card and say, yes, I want you to have a look at the before page here. I might even print off a document and tick a box. So I want you to watch this video. I want you to read that post and then come back and see me. But you might not have that resource available to you. So what is it that you do? Well, we start at the very beginning with the history. Now, you know and I know that our world would be a lot healthier if all of us paid attention to SNAP. Smoking, nutrition, alcohol and physical exercise, they always matter. And they particularly matter 
with pregnancy planning and during pregnancy. What about the personal history of actually both parents to be? It matters for both of them, their medical history, their surgical history, their emotional and mental health history. Is there a history of domestic violence that needs to be named and, and addressed? Menstrual history, cervical screening, have they had a pregnancy before? So what was the outcome? Family history, and especially as it relates to conditions that might influence uh, a pregnancy journey, so mental health, diabetes, hypertension, preeclampsia, um, pregnancy, um, adverse pregnancy outcomes, recurrent miscarriages, fetal anomalies, those sorts of things. Medications, are they taking any, any over the counter? Are they safe to use? Are they not safe to use during pregnancy? Do you have um, somebody on a medication that you would really wanna stop if they were pregnant? Should you stop it now and transfer them to some other medication? Are there vaccinations up to date? Um, do they need to have a um, rubella booster? What's their serology tell you? Varicella is not so helpful. If they've had varicella, the infection, assume protection. If they've had varicella, the immunization, then the blood test isn't terribly accurate because the antibody levels are quite low and generally not measurable on a blood test. So you assume if they've had two, only one was funded, if they've had two vaccinations, you assume that they are covered. Influenza and pertussis immunizations are best given during pregnancy. However, if it's influenza season, please go ahead and opportunistically immunize all those who are eligible, which is actually everybody over the age of six months. And as you go, update the clinical record. It's just so helpful when it comes time to make a referral if you don't have to wade through three or four old prescriptions or you know, weed out UTI or 30 in a past diagnosis. The hyperlink on this page is to uh, the Royal Women's Hospital in Sydney. They've got a heap of information, including some preconception advice in other languages and some helpful medication in pregnancy and breastfeeding um, information sheets from MotherSafe. Examination, well, it's really quite basic actually, unless the history suggests otherwise. Blood pressure, height, weight, calculate BMI, listen to the heart, they're the essentials. Certainly interested if there's any suggestion of a cardiac anomaly or any need to refer on before pregnancy. Um, we used to routinely do breast and indeed pelvic examinations, but we're more circumspect these days. So only if indicated um, and anything else, of course, as indicated by the history. Now, the advice that you will give couples trying to conceive um, will vary depending upon their history, their family history, their ethnicity. But the essentials are as follows. The Australian guidelines recommend that all women planning a pregnancy supplement with folic acid and iodine. Most couples understand how the process of making a baby works, the traditional process, but every now and then it helps to spell it out and to confirm that they do understand what is necessary. Most couples in Australia have little or no experience about the different models of care. And it's worth introducing them to what is available in your area, as well as what they would prefer and can they afford. If they wish to have private, midwifery or obstetric care, is that available where you are? And do they have the level of insurance, I need a gold policy to cover them and even with top hospital cover, there will be significant out-of-pocket expenses. So make them aware of that. Genetic carrier testing is increasing in its profile. And importantly, we need to have these conversations, ideally preconception. The big three are cystic fibrosis, spinal muscular atrophy, and fragile X syndrome. However, depending upon the family history, you may wish to consider an expanded panel of tests. And please recommend that they have their dental checkup. Investigations that you order will flow from the history, personal history, family history, ethnicity, exposures to chemicals. There's a whole range of things that might make us think we need to be doing different testing. 
always you should follow your local guideline because it will be nuanced for the populations and the incidence of conditions where you are. So blood group, we always want to know. We may also be interested in antibodies if they've had a previous pregnancy or blood transfusion. Full blood count, rubella, varicella, if they're unsure if they've had an infection, keep in mind no point testing if they've had the vaccination and the vaccinations were introduced in 2000 and were publicly funded from 2005 here in Australia. If their cervical screening is due, great time to bring it up to date. Uh, tests that you might want to do would include some infection screens, uh, chlamydia, for example, but syphilis is also on the rise and in certain populations, hep B, hep C, HIV are also entirely relevant. Are they a blood donor? Is there a high incidence of iron deficiency in the community that they're part of? Ferritin, B12, vitamin D, what dietary restrictions or lifestyle um, do they have that might put them at an increased risk? Uh, if their BMI is above 30, if they are um, on antihypertensives, then ELFTs, protein creatinine ratio, it's good to have that as a baseline. Hemoglobin A1C, if there's a history or a high risk of having diabetes or gestational diabetes. And if their menstrual history uh, talks of or, or suggests that they may have polycystic ovaries, then a pelvic ultrasound may also be in order. The unfunded um, at the moment uh, in June 2022, unfunded would include the carrier status testing. This is going to be, or has been announced to be funded by Medicare from the end of 2023, and I look forward to that. <sighs> GBS cytomegalovirus and herpes simplex. These are difficult ones. Group B streptococcus is an important pathogen, but testing even during pregnancy is fraught with complexity because the infection may or may not show on the swab that you do, and if it does show, it may not be present at birth. And if it doesn't show, it may be present at birth. So follow your local guideline, not routinely recommended preconception. Cytomegalovirus, also not recommended routinely preconception. So important. I wish there was a vaccine. Uh, certainly women who develop symptoms consistent with cytomegalovirus, yes, we would want testing to be done. It's just an awful infection. And herpes simplex is so very common. Uh, we're really more interested if a woman gets a primary infection during pregnancy or has an outbreak close to birth. Those are the times when herpes simplex becomes most relevant. So I know what you're thinking. Um, all of that in 15 minutes, it's just not gonna happen. Yes, whether they've um, booked the appointment, especially if they've got their hand on the door, it's just no way. So I put together a preconception checklist um, and I ask, it's a takeaway. I print it out and I ask uh, couples to fill it out. The first page is mostly about the, the woman's history. Second page includes information for um, their partner, the biological parent to be. Uh, and I also have an action list that I have created uh, <clears throat> and hope that it would be useful. I then ask them to fill it out get the blood tests as indicated and uh, any scans that would be recommended and review them with the results and to give them advice. So thank you very much for watching. I hope that this was helpful and this QR code will take you to the preconception page on Maternity Matters if you'd like to explore some more. Thank you very much.